2018, Professor McHugh was awarded the UW Distinguished Teaching Award, the uh, most prestigious award for teaching at the University of Washington. If any of you have taken a course from her, you know why. So please join me in welcoming uh, Frances McHugh. Thank you so much. Um, I'm honored to be here. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm so glad to be here with you, and thank you to my colleagues for inviting me to speak today. Uh, graduation is a big deal, and the people who carried you here should be honored as well. Congratulations. You've seen... You've seen a lot of teaching at your time here at UW. You've been in classrooms with some amazing professors, and that's good because all of you, in some way or another, are going to become teachers. You'll be showing your boss, maybe soon, how to run Tableau. You'll be editing and writing some of your colleagues' work. You'll be teaching your families what it is you actually do in your job. <laughs> You'll be teaching your elders how to make a profile on social media. You will someday teach your children or your relatives' children how to play a sport or a card game or how to read. And that's one earmark of a great education your ability to step into that role of conveying ideas and skills in ways that other people can understand. Your studies in literature, cultural studies, and writing will give you a profound advantage. To be honest with you, uh, teaching is really about two things. It's about having the best conversation you can have with a person or a group of people. And it's about minding the edges of that conversation. As a teacher heading into my own classroom on sometimes a very long walk across campus, when I'm feeling nervous and jittery and excited because I'm gonna come into a room with you, I'm thinking, what's the best conversation we can have today? In real time, in this place where we are now, Sure, I've planned what we're going to be doing, and I've revised, and I've brought my props, and I've made my lesson plan, but I'm always thinking about the best conversation. Is there something from the outside world that is leaked in that we need to talk about? How does the work we are reading or writing connect to this place at this time? And this is done without a PowerPoint deck or without your phones. And I have to be open to the ideas that are going to come up in that room and what adventures will be called upon. That's what teaching really is. It's being very well prepared ahead of time and then having the courage to instigate and tend to the best possible conversation. To do that, and I hope you will do this too in your meetings and with your family and with your friends and in all of the arenas in which you'll be teaching, I try to see my students and have them see me. I hold a set of expectations. Please talk, please engage, please listen, please connect. And I have some limits too. Hey, you're kind of rambling on about yourself in a way that's, well, gone on a little long. <laughs> or maybe you're saying something that somebody else already said. Or maybe you're not being as kind as I know you could be. So I'll gently push you back into the heart of the conversation. Teaching is kind of like entering a special chamber where you're stepping into the best self you can be. You're trying to be alert, generous, encouraging. It's my job to open that space and to host good ideas and willing visitors. Then with some sense of radical hospitality, visitors become residents, and we form a little community together. But how do people go from being visitors 
to being real inhabitants of a place of learning. Which brings me to my second part. The second part of teaching is minding the edges. The edges of a conversation might be where some students are quiet, where they hold back from engaging, where you can sense fear or apathy. As a teacher, I'll reach out and beckon them into the conversation. Minding the edges really is about insisting in all the voices that have been pushed to the fringes. And you all have had some experiences with some very difficult conversations because you've studied literature, an art form that can be so controversial and challenging that it's hard sometimes to even have the courage to frame its repercussions in language. Maybe the events in a novel are so despicably racist that you feel the best conversation dropping off into avoidance or the dominance of one or two people. Bringing in voices that haven't been heard much before, both in the content of what you're focusing on and in the three-dimensional space of people. People convening in real time, that's the core of the whole thing. That's the secret. Minding the edges is being equity-minded. And you will head into the world having participated in deep and challenging conversations. Now, these conversations don't always happen quite in the way you think they will. One day last year, a student came to my door during office hours, and the student was wearing a bear suit. Hi, I said. Welcome. <laughs> On the way to a costume party? I'm a bear today, the student says. I can see the eyes of this person blinking out from the inside of the suit. And I look, I look the student over and I think, wow, that's a nice suit. I mean, it, it's not like a mascot suit, you know, all filthy after a sports event or something. Or like one of the, the characters wandering Seattle Center. I mean, this is a nice bear suit. <laughs> I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, you know, undermine this at all. All right. So I say, do you wanna talk about a paper or class? I wanna talk about reading and writing, the bear says. Who was this bear? I'm thinking, can the bear sit down? Is there even room enough in here at this table? Please, I say, have a seat. I look at the bear, taking in the whole presence. Have you been a bear long? <laughs> well, not, la not that long, says the bear. Are you in one of my classes? Yes, but I'm not a bear in class. I've been recently trying out being a bear. It gives me perspective. Wow. I say, that's so interesting. How did you end up becoming a bear? What's your story? I'm a grizzly, the bear says. I've been sadly domesticated. I found myself living in a house on the Sammamish Plateau as a kid, back when I didn't know I was a bear. When I took English classes then, I just wrote what they told me to. You know, like five paragraph essays, droning on, shoving in quotes to support my point. Wow, that sounds terrible, I say. It was. Those ways of writing, they, didn't just, they just didn't match who I was. Did you know that bears are being driven out of the wilderness because of food scarcity and salmon are disappearing from streams? Yes, I say. Well, I want to inhabit that plight, the bear says. The bear hands me a clutch of poems. Would you like to talk about them, I ask? And then we do. But you know, I really, I never could figure out which student the bear was. I, you know, I'd go into class and I'd kind of scan the room. And I'd think, who is it, who is it? But I couldn't tell at all. And then I felt kind of sad about the plight of real bears and the plight of the student bear who didn't feel comfortable being a bear in class. But someday you guys will meet a bear. Inhabiting a perspective, a point of view, you all know how to do that now. You've read novels and poems and stories and essays. Literature allows you to bear witness. <laughs> Sorry, I had to go there. Uh, <laughs> to experience something you haven't. 
You're looking in from the outside. You can feel what it's like to be included in something you might not even want to be included in. Maybe you haven't been orphaned and left with relatives in a tiny town in Idaho, but Marilyn Robinson's housekeeping will let you experience that. Marilyn Robinson got a PhD from here. You're in good company. Or maybe you are following Ichiro and John Okada's No-No Boy and seeing what it may have been like to come home from prison and from a US internment camp. John Okada attended UW as well. You see inside these plights and suddenly you can see history and the situations people can end up in. It's like rehearsing for actual life. No wonder psychologists in training read novels. Well, they should. So you've had all these responses to what you've read, and you've invented new ways to express those responses. Making things up is something you know how to do. It's funny, you know, around here people talk a lot about entrepreneurship. Did you all see the signs everywhere? Entrepreneur, make your own job. You know, startup, Seattle. You know who the purest form of an entrepreneur is? A poet. Here's why, they're making up things all the time that the world didn't know they wanted, <laughs> right? And then they're insisting them into the marketplace. Um, and I know that the commerce on the back end is woeful, so we'll stop the metaphor there, but <laughs> I still think insisting something into the world, surrounding it with aura and a sense of value is something worth thinking about. Poets take snippet after snippet, impressions, observations, sounds, songs, and then they make something. Every poet really is running a startup. In writing, you have made judgment calls. You listen to your writing voice. You move things around to say the best things you could say in the best possible way. You made choices, you followed your judgment based on what you've observed and read and consulted. You toned an argument. Maybe you created a fine short story with a robust narrative arc. You sustained complex ideas, you speculated, conversed, balanced your personal and cultural perspectives with what happens in a work of literature. You developed your imagination and sense of empathy and your own voice and you've listened to and supported the work of your colleagues. In fact, making a classroom or an organization or a nonprofit or a company follows the exact same arc of innovation. You make choices, you follow your judgment based on what you've observed and read and consulted. You sustain complex ideas, you speculate, you converse, you balance your personal and cultural perspectives with what happens in the organization. And you listen to and you support the work of your colleagues. Okay, so maybe you won't be writing papers on the tropes of dress ornamentation in Jane Austen novels anymore. Those days might be maybe behind you but you might write a white paper on how Columbia sportswear should change their supply chain. Or you might write a paper on why drinking water is so scarce in certain regions. It's optimistic to create an essay, a poem, a story, or an organization, or a space for learning. What do English majors do? What do MA and MFA and PhD graduates in English do? Honestly, we don't really know. <laughs> we can't keep up with all the directions that you all will take. It's all bear suits to us. We do know that certain skills, the ones that are so obvious we don't always see them right in front of us, are the ones you will call on. May you have great conversations May you mind the edges, inhabit different perspectives, may you make things up, and may you too sit down with bears. Thank you.